Hey, my name is Robert Fanaro, and I played Eugene Pontecorvo on The Sopranos. And you're listening to Chris Contra on The Rock Stop. Welcome into The Rock Stop. Chris Contra here. My guest tonight, a very talented actor, probably best known for playing in one of the biggest TV shows of all time. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, if you look at any any of the lists listing the greatest TV shows, this show is always at least in the top three. I am, of course, talking about The Sopranos. He played Eugene Pontecorvo. This is Robert Fanaro. How you doing, Robert? All right, Chris. Thank you very much for the uh, intro. That was very nice of you. Definitely, man. So uh, great to have you here, and um, I mean, can you believe it? It's 20 years now since the show debuted. It's hard to believe it's 20 years. I mean, when I was working on the set, Jimmy uh, Gandolfini would always say, in five years, this is not going to even matter. <laughs> <laughs> he would say, everyone's going to forget about it. But this 20-year anniversary, people have not forgot about how much fun they had and sadness and all that roller coaster ride that they they um, they were on with uh, Tony Soprano and his family and all the crew members and all their personalities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Now, you joined the show in the third season. Can you tell us mm-hmm. about uh, how, how you got involved with the show? Yes, I can tell you. Me and James Gandolfini, we did a play 10 years prior to Sopranos. I mean, 10 or 8 years prior to Sopranos. It was like one of our first paying jobs. We toured a streetcar named Desire for this producer, I forgot his name, in, in Europe. Um, and they did Cuckoo's Mask the year prior, and uh, this director, Judy, they got cast in Streetcar. Uh, they did Cuckoo's Nest. That's what I said. Yeah. I'm getting confused. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> we did three months in Scandinavia. Uh, we started in Sweden. We played the big places in Sweden, small places. We went to Finland, and then we took a ferry uh, from Sweden to Finland, and then we went to Norway, and it was a three-month tour, and we had such great fun and great times. And I played Stanley, believe it or not. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and of course, believe it, uh, Jan's going to think Jimmy was a great niche. And um, maybe we got it once, twice, or three times right, but we really had a lot of fun, and we applied ourselves. And we also had a good time uh, drinking a lot of beers and getting drunk. And, and so then, 10 years uh, later, a friend of mine, uh, Gordon, um, he goes, and he's at this party, and he says, uh, hey, I know a good friend of yours. You did the street call with him. Uh, oh, yeah, who was that? Uh, Bobby Fanaro. And uh, some of my friends call me Bobby. And, oh, Robert Fanaro. I think James B. called me Robert at that point. But anyway, oh, what's Robert doing? Well, he's working at Carolyn's Comic. What's he doing? What's the manager there? And my friend Gordon was like, he yeah, was fresh. He was a fresh man. If I was you, I would get your friend Bobby a job. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, it was at season three, and they were looking for a Ralph Cifaretto, and they were having a hard time looking for him. And James remembered me, and remembered he uh, that I was working at Caroline's. He got his driver, Joe Faye, and he actually didn't remember, and he went to a couple of clubs one night after the, after the Silver Cup shooting, and they found me, and they went to a couple of clubs, I believe, and then they got to Caroline's, and at six o'clock, James is waiting, and he's at the bar. And he's hanging out, and I walk in because I'm managing the night shift. Yeah. And I say, James, what are you doing here? <laughs> this is great, man. Congratulations on that. I went into one time, and I was kitchen at the bar. We said hello to each other, and we may have got together one time with another friend to have some drinks and have a beer, you know, and talk about what we did. But anyway, we had really broke up our relationship. I mean, not broke up, but we had, and, you know, not you know together, you know, as friends, you know, we kept in touch. Right. So anyway, he t- tells me. Look, there's a part on the show. I like you. To, I like you to audition. I can't promise you anything, but I want you to audition for the show. He said, "Man, I, 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 okay." And he says to me, "Have you been acting?" I said, "Chris, sure, I've been acting. It was bullshit. I've been acting for like six or seven years. I was family. I was working, trying to make money to get my family going. Up. I never gave up on the idea to be an actor. But the rest is history. I auditioned for George Allen Walker. He said, "No, I can't promise anything." I booked the role of Ralph Silveretto. I got that part. I was contracted. If you look at that season three, I'm in the front credits. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the thing was, when we started shooting it, 
uh, David, the genius that he is, he didn't like the chemistry between me and James. He thought we were two big guys, and he wanted maybe a smaller guy like David Proval. And they got, of course, Joey Pantoliani to do it. He, you know, he tried putting gray in my hair, and it wasn't working. And David called me up and said, listen, it's not going to work out, but we want to make a character for you because we really loved your audition. Wow. We're going to call him your James Hontacoro. And what is this about? What is he about? We'll, we'll do it like all TV. We'll do it as we go along. <laughs> we'll make you one of Ralph's crew members. And the rest is history. I want this. And it was really good because... I really was my first professional job, and I really knew, knew jack shit. <laughs> I didn't know what a mark was. A big <laughs> deal. I forgot his was looking at that mark. He was looking at me like, yo, open this up. When I got, you know, when I first was Ralph. So there was a lot of inexperience I had. But then I had my apprenticeship on the show, and it was terrific to have that kind of apprenticeship and develop that character. And, of course, culminating in numbers only. That was really the apex of, of the experience. Your breakout episode was also your last episode. Yes. Correct. Yeah. But I was happy, Chris, about it because, you know, before then I was known for the snapple bottle, that fucking crazy Eugene snap. <laughs> and you hit that guy over the head, you know, yeah. little uh, junior over the head with a snapple bottle. I call Capitano now, who writes for Deuce, the Deuce. But the thing was, is that, um, you know, I'm a real theater actor too. And, and, and I remember some interviews with uh, Brando. And Brando said, you know, they, and I could have been a continuous speech there on the water for. People really identified with that. You know, I could have been somebody. It was you, Charlie. It was you, you know. You, you, you were my brother. You were supposed to look at How many people have had that kind of situation? You know, yeah. their brothers. And so I had a situation where there's a guy that wanted to get out, and he can't get out. And how many people have been in a situation? They can't get out, and they're locked in. Yep. You know what I mean? That's it. And they, and they kill themselves, you know what I mean? But yeah. I thought that that trajectory was something people might just remember me by and they did yeah two lines but this was a time I really can sink my teeth into um, uh, a storyline you know yeah uh, between my wife and my son with the drugs and it, it was, really had a great arc to it right, right that's what I loved about it you know yeah that was I mean it was a very memorable episode it started off the season um, season was six, I believe it was, and uh, and it, yeah, you really, you finally had a a, a real story for your uh, character there, and yeah. and th- it had so many dynamics of it, like you said. I mean, here you you inherited the two million dollars. You you know, you and your family want to go to Florida. You got a kid with drug right. drug problems. It's like there's right. so many dynamics going on, and I mean, I remember watching that episode and really like feeling for you, and then you find out yeah. at the end that you were a flipped guy. And then it was just like this utter hopelessness with your character. Yeah, I think some people, they'll come up to me, hey, you're a rat. And I say, I tell them, you know, I said, I never ratted. I killed myself. Did Tony get, go to court because of my uh, statement or whatever? But Kurt died. I died. But, you know, Tony was never uh, prosecuted by what I said. So how could I be a rat? Mm-hmm. I fucking killed myself. I knew the only way out to liberate my family. Yeah. Not that that was said in the show, but that was the reason, my reason, you know, that, you know, it wasn't said that way. You know, I think Michael said that the guy was a thought or something, you know, Michael Imperial. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but, you know, I mean, that was my justification. It's the only way out for my family. So right. I really dug it and I thought people can remember it and they have, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing about that episode with the members only episode is that you're your death scene was so like uh, shocking would have been like a topper in most episodes. But then five minutes later, uncle junior shoots Tony. Yeah. I, I remember watching that episode as it, the day it aired that when it premiered and um, I don't know, I have uh direct TV, which in rainstorms, it does not fare well. And uh, we lost, oh, yeah. we lost the picture. It was cutting in and out throughout the show, but I did see your, when your character hung himself <laughs> and you know, I was like shocked by that. And then my picture cut out. And then my brother calls me and he goes, can you believe what happened? I said, yeah, I can't. Eugene killed himself. I can't believe it. And he said, yeah. well, yeah, that happened. But also, you know, Tony got shot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Do you feel that kind of over, it, overshadowed your uh, your character's demise? Well, you know, it was, it was, first of all, David really didn't, he couldn't tell anybody about that. You know what I mean? He, he couldn't tell anybody about it. I felt like, well, yeah, that kind of, I thought that would, it would end with me. Yeah. But it it was a it was a really surprise to me because I didn't know it. I didn't know that that was going to happen, you know. But uh, they had a whole season uh, to to uh, to do, so right. it was understandable. They had to continue going on. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought it was yeah, 
<laughs> it does was a, it was a bit of a letdown, but not too much because I did what I had to do. You know, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely, I was happy to do what I had to do, and uh, just to be remembered, not just for a crew member that had some sort of trajectory. Right, you know, like Gannis, Joe, Joe Gannisoli had the gay trajectory, which he asked for. By the way, it's all about it. I thought that it was just a little bit too much. It was yeah. Yeah, I, um, the, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how many people liked it. You know, really liked it. You know, I thought the initial moment where you found out that he was into that was quite shocking. But I do, I agree with you. I think it did go on for much too long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so after yeah, I, love, I love Joe again. It's cool. He's a very nice guy, very nice man, and I was happy for him that he had that. Yeah, right. At least he it, had his own story. He had a storyline like that. Yeah, yeah. So after you uh, left the, or got you know written off the show and everything, did you keep watching it? Sure, yeah, of course I you keep watching it. You want to see what happens. You know what I mean? And uh, were you were you a fan of great it? actors? You know, Junior. You know, I mean. Uh, oh yeah, I mean. Yeah. You look at you look at TV like these days. Everybody you know with the Netflix and DVR and stuff. It seemed like that show was one of the last shows where on, uh, people knew on Sunday night you know to be in front of your TV. Yeah. Oh yeah, you want to be in front of your TV with that? Yeah. yeah. So, so you watched the show before you uh, were on it as well, right? You enjoyed it? Uh, not avidly. I did watch it, but I wasn't a gigantic fan of it. I was just trying to make ends meet. You know what I mean? Um, right, right. I didn't have a lot of time to with my children and everything, but I knew that James was really successful. But I didn't really jump on board until I until I started uh, acting in it. Yeah. And saw, wow, what a show this is. It really is tremendous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then that's your, and you're, you know, you're talking about James Gandolfini, the late, great James Gandolfini. And, and it really yeah. shows his character as a, as a person that he would remember you and want you to be part of the show after, you know, not speaking to him for, you know, almost a decade or whatever it was. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, James was the kind of man who would send the elevator down for his friends. And mm-hmm. that random act of, of uh, I'm so thankful and blessed by God that he did that for me. I always remember him by that. Now, after that, you know, uh, we became friends and uh, better friends. Um, but, you know, the only thing I, re- I really regret is that I didn't really reach out to him. I reached out to him for some things, like, you know, to help me out with um, his agent and stuff like that. And, you know, but the thing is, I, the thing is, when you have that kind of success, and I tried to figure this out, sometimes I, I'm on my bed, I'm thinking about him, and I'm saying, well, James has two lives. The life that he lived before he became Tony Soprano, and the life of Tony Soprano and that celebrity. Mm-hmm. Everyone before, he knew that loved him for who he was. Everyone after, they, were, they wanted something, and they really weren't genuine. Yeah. And James was like this. He knew the genuine people. And if you were genuine with him and he felt you were, he invited me to his toys place on the Jersey Shore, invited me and my son to go to his Statue of Liberty. I would have reached out to him and said, hey, let's hang out tonight. Let's chill. Let's, you know, and he would have said yes. You know what I mean? And that's what I truly, I do regret that because time had passed. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he gave me every chance. And I did. Sometimes we did, but. Well, she just did it a little bit more. You know, what can I say? You know, I love them, and I'm so thankful that he was my friend. And yeah, absolutely. And then. You know, people in in, his, in Hollywood. I mean, the, the the thing about the Sopranos, it seemed like uh, a lot of Jersey. I mean, everybody was from Jersey. It seemed like, and everybody got along very well. And I don't think you get that same type of thing when you know you reach the Hollywood echelon of a higher. Um, you don't well, get that well, genuine. Well, not about that hierarchy. Like that was void on Sopranos. Everyone, James was so approachable. He would, you know, he talked to any an extra. He he, he and, and and everyone. Everyone felt the same way, like royal family. He spread that love. Yeah. You know, he was unique in that way. And now, when I got to do Law and Order, other things, I said, well, this is kind of weird. This is not like Sopranos. Yeah. This is that actor's hanging out by himself. He's like, you know, he's kind of like got his nose in the air, like, you know, and he's yeah. kind of a little bit arrogant and everything, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, and never on Sopranos, it didn't matter. Who you are, you were going to be treated the same way, and that was the unique thing about it. Yeah. Um, did you do you mentioned earlier, like you know, there's James Gandolfini before the Tony character, and then after the Tony, you know, Soprano came yep. into his life. Did he did he ever like um, worry about being typecast at all? Like, I mean, it, clearly he was going to be. I mean, it, that character was so you know iconic. But um, did, did that bother him at all? 
Oh, you notice that if you look at the credits, you see uh, uh, James uh, Gandolfini's vocal coach. He had that put in there. I mean, I never spoke to him about it, but I noticed it uh, because that was one of the things. He wanted to just make people clear that he didn't talk away, and he did. Yeah, right. He wasn't in what people would assume that he did. That's why I said uh, James Gandolfini's vocal coach, if you look at the credits, yeah. every credit, mm -hmm. his vocal coach, and it was true. That wasn't James. And he did have to break out of that mold. Uh, but James was very careful in what he chose to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If he proved that he can be something more than just the Italian guy. I saw him on Broadway seeing the caveman when he played a real family guy yeah. uh, without any kind of accent. He was terrific in that. So, But he did have to break them all. I think every Italian actor... Um, if you look at like Bogey and you know, if you look at Cagney, but they had their you know they had that, that that wise guy period. I have been able to do it a little bit. The last thing I did was Sinner with Jessica Biel, even though my last name ended in an I and a vowel. It's still this guy was an upstate Italian guy. He wasn't a, 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 a you might say a bullion. You know what I mean? <laughs> he wasn't a Eugene. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. So uh, yeah. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> that, that does a good job of answering it. Yes. Good. Um, so now to speak about David Chase for a minute, I uh, one thing I will notice about David Chase is that he was not afraid to go against the mold and piss off the fans in uh, you know he in in the Sopranos he would he would do things that you know the fans did not want to see. But well, you know, you know, any great work is somewhat autobiographical. I think Melfi, the psychiatrist, you know. Um, I think what people identify with surprise because although they're not wise guys, they're, they're people who are rich and had everything but are miserable and they're going to make everyone around them miserable because they're miserable, you know? <laughs> yeah. And somewhat, you know, Tony Soprano was like that, you know? Yeah. They had everything, yet they had problems. And I think that it was one of biographical with David too. And, his life reflected Tony's life. You know, they were somewhat similar in, I'm not saying, you know, you know, with David with the therapy and stuff like that, but I'm just saying they were similar in that way, the ducks and all yeah. that other stuff in, in the beginning episodes. Um, there were human things that people could recognize. And uh, David is a bit of a leprechaun. He's a bit of a gnome. You know, he pops up and, <laughs> you know, on the set. And I worked with him on Not Fade Away. With Lisa Lampanelli, uh, it wasn't it was very, very successful. My, and then I got really, really sick, and I couldn't finish the damn thing because I had a part of my stomach removed. I had some bad, bad illness, and oh. that was sad that I couldn't finish it. They yeah. put a stand-in, you know, uh, uh, for me, and I had a lot more stuff, and who knows? But you know, it was what it was, and, and I was happy to work with James again in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not fade away. I thought it was a good idea. Maybe fell short a little bit. Mm -hmm. But now we can look forward to the prequel. And that's probably a lot more autobiographical, something that he really, really knows and yeah. uh, he's more familiar with. And although the Not Fade Away was how he, he can't, got to Hollywood. I mean, he, that was autobiographical in a way. That was his story. Yeah, right. I mean, how he made it to Hollywood. He worked in Northern Exposure, a writer and a creator, a producer. Yeah, David Chase fans so, will definitely want to check that one out. Not Fade Away. Yeah. I mean, you got to do what you do best. I mean, not everyone's Fellini, and not everyone's uh, Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. You are what you are, and we have to accept the things that we can change. I mean, we cannot change it, and then change the things that we can, like Francis on the CC. Right. You know? Yeah. Now, you mentioned the prequel, the movie. Uh, I, I heard uh, my, um, Gandolfini's son is going to actually play the young Tony. Michael is. Yeah. Yeah. So right. it's scary. You know, my feeling is a little scary because... Although Michael will be is surrounded, and I know Michael, you know, he's surrounded by a lot of, not a, we met and we hung out together, not recently, not in his acting career. I know him way when he was a young man, mm -hmm. like he was say, almost a year younger than my own, my, own, my oldest son, Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of pressure, you yeah. know what I mean? And I think he's insulated enough to know that. And I think he knows from his father, like, you just do this and just, don't care. I mean, if it happens, it happens. But if you really want to do this, just stick to it. Right. I mean, because like you got to think about it, the world is going to be watching, and you know, and and I know he'll be comfortable. I know that everybody around him's going to love him, and he's going to be great. But it is a lot of pressure. Oh you yeah. Know what I mean, definitely. I mean, especially in the you know when it when it's finally done, and 
I mean, what people say, they can be brutal sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. sometimes you don't want to be on the world stage. You want to just kind of build up to it. But right. uh, hopefully Michael will rise to the occasion like his dad always did. And even if he, even if it doesn't rise to the occasion, he has the, the background and the foundation to keep going. And that's important. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Um, so, so this this prequel is it a movie or is it a show? I'm not even clear. I on. believe it's a film. I believe it's a film. It's going to be a film. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah. far as a film, you oh. know, I know like then I read something in I think Variety or Highway Report that Marty was supposed to do a Marty Scorsese or just worked with an Irish was supposed to do something with Leonardo DiCaprio as a film, and now they they made it into a. Uh, they're going to make it into a series. I don't know what the story is about. It's about something around there, you know? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, you never know what it, what can happen to it, but right now, I, I believe it's going to be a film. Okay, yeah. All right. So, yeah, we'll see how that uh, pans out. Yeah, I guess it's before the show, before the before Sopranos. I know that Michael plays, I mean, his uncle, I think, is uh, Michael Imperioli, uh, his, you know, his father, is a, is, is a very focal part, and Uncle Junior, I guess, or a young Uncle Junior, Michael yeah. Imperioli's father, is a main character in it, and he kind of gets Tony uh, into into it and everything, you know. Right, right. Um, I, think, I, I know that from the uh, 20th anniversary. They we're talking about it a little bit. Yeah, you yeah. Know? There's a lot of talk about that. I mean, have, have people uh, have you been uh, seeing yourself getting uh, more attention lately with the 20th anniversary? There's a lot of talk about it. Yeah, a lot of talk about it. You know, a lot of you know, 20th anniversary is. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, I didn't do any of the. Uh, <clears throat> the shows or anything like that. They wanted the first season. They asked for the first season. Yeah, so yeah, I've noticed. I that, wasn't yeah. included in that. But you know, like I always thought, say, you know, you got to be invited to the party. You know, <laughs> if you're not invited to the party, you keep going. Right. <laughs> you know, they can't get everybody in the party sometimes. They just they just don't the capacity. I hear you. I hear you. I did want to ask you about the um, the series finale. I mean, it's one of the most highly debated finales of all time. Now, I actually right. I, I came across a clip of um, the other day, actually, uh, saw you c- coming out of, did you see the screening, uh, like, with the, the rest of the cast of the finale? Yes. Yeah, because I saw it on Access Hollywood or something, and I said, hey, there he is, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, so, I saw it, I saw it was great. So how was it with watching it with everybody? It was terrific. I mean, you know, they, you know, they took a lot of heat for it, you know what I mean, but, uh, um. I thought it was great. I mean, I, I, I'm a believer in that life goes on, that um, the Selma and Louise, it's not always like Selma and Louise. They jump off, they, you know, they, they drive their car off a cliff. Right. Or you walk into the sunset. Uh, I'm more of a firm believer, like, um, uh, I'm a very big Cassavet, John Cassavetti fan, and I love his films because they're always open-ended at the end. Yeah. You know, in Husbands, they go, they go on a tear in Husbands, but they all return to their lives, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's a great situation. <laughs> Life just goes on. And right. I think that that's what David was trying to, to show. I think I think the best person, I really can't take credit for it, was Peter Bogdanovich. If you look online of his description of the final episode, I think he really explains it really well. He says it was a cross section of America and that uh, you had the Boy Scouts, you had the members only guy, right. and uh, you were able to interpret it and make your own interpretation of how it ends. I think, but I think that more or less it's a universal thing that, you know, there's always going to be graft. There's always going to be Tony. It's going to perpetuate, and it has perpetuated through time. But just people, the drug dealers and the, and the, and the mafia found other ways to make money, but it perpetuates. The killing, it still happens. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Governments do it. and It still happens. There's, there's still broken families. and the, I mean, it's a universal thing. You know, the Boy Scouts, the rappers, the, that whole thing. It was symbolic of what life really is about. Right. You know, that universal, universality of life and the perpetuation that, that you know, that there's going to be other Tony Sopranos. You know, they're going yeah. to have families, but, you know, they're not going to be, you know, they're not always going to live till 60 years old. Right, right. You know, I, I that think, was my, and I, Bogdanovich, I think, describes it best. Right. I mean, there's so many people that look at it different ways. I mean, a lot of people just wanted that, you know, the Hollywood ending, you know, something that just gives them, whether it's good or bad, it gives them some sort of resolution. And they, yeah, they like, wanted a bang them up thing, you know, Tony, you know, banging them up or whatever, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. driving off a cliff or something like that. <laughs> Fuck it. You know, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> they, they, wanted, they want something that big. They wanted a big finale. I mean, I thought like, 
you know, Frank Vincent was a great character when you know when they roll over his head. Yeah. Uh, and they made and they had the sound. I thought you know it could have been even better if they had a little bit of like uh, Brian De Palma, like a little slow motion of the blood splattering or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because everyone hated Frank's uh, Frank's character. Oh know? yeah, right. But uh, I rolled over his head. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was you know, yeah. I mean, they wanted something like that. Right. You know, they right. Wanted they wanted something like that. They didn't get it. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, you know, yeah. It's uh, I mean, we all want finality, but it doesn't mean. Is there really finale and everything? It's, it, I don't think there is. You know? No, you're right. There's really not. We, we die, another you know, baby is born, it, it, life goes on, our bloodline continues. Yeah. In yeah. the beginning of time for when we were created, you know, either it continues or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. You know, but we're all, think about it, how many, whew, so many souls, wow. Yeah. Up to this point, man. Wow. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I mean, this is, if you really think about all that, that's very true. <laughs> it's overwhelming. Yeah, you don't always have the uh, Hollywood ending that uh, that people wanted for it, and I guess that's kind of what that uh, that last episode kind of you know leaves it leaves it open for all the all the come afterwards. Uh, ultimately, the show is uh, remembered as one of the all time greats, and I mean, you know, it's a drama show, but. Man, did it encompass everything? I mean, I, I watched it. I laughed my ass off throughout most of it too. I mean, it's so much uh, humor in it as yeah, well. Some good and some great, 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 great humor. Yeah, Stevie, yeah, Stevie, great, great character, Silvio, and just uh, <clears throat> all all the characters, many best stars, and some funny stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. did you guys bullshit a lot? Like uh, in between takes, you guys have like a real good time. Yeah, yeah, we had a great time. We had a great time talking. I mean, if it wasn't a serious thing that, you know, especially at times with the bada bing, yeah. you know, with the strip tease joint, you know, you know what I mean? Just uh, shooting the shit and, and uh, you know, <laughs> something when days are not a lot required of you, I mean, you can have a great time. When things are a little bit more required of you, you need a little bit more focus. You, right, you know, you right. Cut yourself off from stuff like that because it can distract you. Yeah. Distract you in a sense of, um, uh, of the focusing. And uh, what you really want to do, what you're doing, because you know, we're all doing something in every scene, and you, you can be distracted, and you won't, you won't seem like um, human. You want to be look human. Uh, yeah. Human. W- when did you receive the scripts for the episodes? Like, was it, were, that was always you said it was kept kind of secret, and then you received it and see what. Uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get the scripts in the mail, you know, and read them, and of course, we did we water them off, you know, with our names on them, and. Yeah, uh, we, were, we were told in secrecy, utmost secrecy. And then, listen, if you went out and you sold the script and we gave the script out, you weren't going to be re returning. I can I guarantee you that. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got to be stupid to do anything like that. But, <laughs> Definitely. I mean, there are stupid people out there. You know what I mean? Like, there was, yeah. I lost a lot of it in Hurricane Sandy and my mom's basement, you know, the original scripts, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. But, yeah, you know, it was nice to keep, you know, I held on to a few. Yeah. I think I lost a lot of them and had them down the basement. Oh, know? that's too bad. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what would you say was your most challenging sequence to shoot throughout the show? Anything really come to mind? Well, I mean, I mean, members only, I mean, the, uh, the, the part when, uh, my wife shows me the drugs. Um, originally I, I felt that it should have a little bit more, melancholy subtlety and we had to do a little reshoot on that you know to, to get him a little bit more um uh, affected by it you yeah. know what i mean that he was almost i was almost in tears yeah um my gut instinct was right you know what i'm saying but um that was a diff- that wasn't an easy scene you know to get her to uh, uh settle basically for to settle for to to to, to you know, to to keep on living, you know, in the in the in there where we were, and, and for me to continue as a captain, you know, Tony, uh, give me a more to do, I get a new car, I'm more pull, yeah, it'll be better for us. And she wants to just get out, and that was a that was a tough, that was basically, I think, one of my toughest scenes. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, you're proud there of was it. a lot to it. It was very meany. And, yeah, right. But I think that the. Um, the want to get it right, the anxiety of getting it right, kind of bled through it, and I was happy about that. But, yeah, you know, it definitely, it definitely bled, that bled through the anxiety. Not getting, maybe I'm unsure. Then that was that kind of worked for the character. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it so. came off very genuine and, and very heart wrenching because like I was saying earlier, that scene, I mean, you just felt Eugene's, you know, hopelessness in the whole situation. And then he goes back and the, 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 the agents are telling him like, well, you got to give up on that Florida thing. You know, just, that was never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Just terrible. Yeah. But uh, yeah, absolutely. A memorable episode. One of the more uh, memorable episodes of the whole show. I think uh, when people talk about the show, members only come. Well, up. Yeah, hanging myself too. I mean, that wasn't easy either. I mean, <laughs> I bet not. You know, I mean, that, you know, that we we had rehearsed it outside of Bonnet Bay. We had put curtains up, and Pete uh, Bacosi, the uh, stunt coordinator, we had worked on it. We got a special harness, and that whole thing wasn't, you know, you know, keeping that, you know, Tim Van Patten, great director. Tell me, just keep that. Hold on to that. You know, hold on to whatever you're doing there. Like just before you jump, you know what I mean? It's great. Um, and it, you know, it, it was even difficult, like the following episode, to be in the coffin too. You know, that was that, I had to get out of the coffin and just walk around. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you're in the coffin, and people don't realize you're in the coffin. Like this, shoot, you got to be in that coffin. Yeah. You, gotta, you know, you're in the shot, and you're there for three, four hours. It's kind of freaky. Wow. You know? Yeah, definitely. That was kind of freaky too. You know. I bet. Yeah. So the coffin scene, that was, uh, you know. <laughs> that's not that's not as easy to play as people might think. You mentioned Tim Van Patten. Um, his, was his daughter the one playing your daughter in that final yes, episode? Grace. Yeah. Grace Van Patten. Wow. So that was his daughter. Grace. Cool. That's very cool. Yeah, it was wonderful. Grace was great. Yeah. Uh, I did get her like a, a beckoning cat thing. I have it in my bathroom. I never got a chance to give it to her. Oh, really? You know, like, I got a little beckoning cat gift to, to her, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was, that's kind of was my beckoning cat show. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's what James gave me, that, you know, that, that show. I mean, he really gave it to me. It really was worth it. He was really happy with it, you know what I mean? He was happy with my performance. And oh, yeah. He really, uh, you know, it was, it was really, it truly was that beckoning cat episode for me. Yeah. You know? Um, so, so, I mean, do you have any, uh, like favorite episodes other than like maybe the ones that you were in, which ones? Really... I love Pine Barrens. I mean, I can't get around Pine Barrens. I yeah. just love that, you know, that like, it's like a Renoir's grand illusion, you know what I mean? That, that struggle to, uh, two prisoners wanting to escape and that struggle between, you know, those two characters, you know, Tony yeah. and, and Michael, uh, Anthony, you know what I yeah. mean? That was that. I guess that's one of my favorite episodes. Of course, you know, there's other ones that, that James did that he's great in. Also, I mean, you know, there's so many of them, of them that I'm great. But that, the funny ones is the ones you really remember. Yeah, you know, the funny ones. And uh, Steve Buscemi, uh, he directed that one, right? The Pine Barrens. Yeah, Steve came in and it was great. To, I mean, I was just like mesmerized. Just Steve Buscemi. I mean. The dude, you know, I mean, <laughs> the dude, he hung out with the dude. I mean, yeah, it was great to, to chat with him and, and to be around him. Uh, never got a chance to be on board with Empire. I think Max Purcell did, but I didn't get a chance to be on it. I never got, um, never got an audition for it because they didn't want certain sopranos. Yeah, right. And they only allowed, they only allowed a certain few, certain chosen few. Yeah, yeah, you had to, you had to have a little bit of pull, I guess, in, in their hearts. So. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any regrets. I mean, that was what it was. It was great an experience to yeah. work with these people. Now, this is a very tough business we, we, we have chosen. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just really tough. I mean, you think that, you know, like I thought so much that, you know, members would only would just open things up. I remember the opening party with, with it, and James said, well, if you don't get anything after this, then you better like, hang it up. And at first, there was just so much, uh, you know, but it really... I stick to it. People remember me, but not as much as I, you know, I thought that it would happen. You know what I mean? That a lot more doors would open. He's kind of was like a, a John Casals kind of character, and I really love John Casals. Uh, um, and you know, I love him in Deer Hunter. I love him in The Godfather. Oh yeah. And I, I think I have that kind of vulnerability um, inside me, um, and I love that. You know, I, you know, I thought it might open things up, but it, it, it truly, you know, it is what it is. You know, Chris. Yeah, keep going. I know what you mean. And uh, it is it's I mean, such a tough industry. You never know where, the, you know, the next break's going to come or if it will ever come. 
but all you can do yeah. is put your, you know, you put your work out there and you do have a, a, a very nice uh, resume. I mean, you're on the great, one of the greatest shows of all time. And I do think you did show off some great acting chops in that episode specifically where you did show that vulnerability. And uh, yeah. it, it is something to be very proud of. I mean, whatever, you know, oh, thank you. Well, it has led to things. I mean, I did get a chance to work in vinyl. I didn't get Boardwalk Empire, but I got hired for vinyl and that was great. Yeah. And, and that... Max got hired for Max got hired for vinyl. That was great to play uh, beside Armin Garrow. Right, I, I I thought that show had a lot of promise, and unfortunately, yeah, it just yeah, went, I, I thought it had a lot of potential, but I guess not. <laughs> that's that's the weird thing about the industry, though. I mean, it's like it's yeah. good as something is, and as you know, fans may even like it. It's you know, for whatever reason, does not you know continue on. So that's the unfortunate part of the. Uh, I I thought it was a no brainer, rock and roll. Uh, yeah, Harry Winter writing it, uh, the Bullock Empire. I mean, I thought it was a no brainer, really. You know, you know, but yeah. uh, I think that the drugs. Father Carnival, who's terrific, and he's an Irishman. I'm, I mean, I got a chance to work with him, an Irishman. The drugs maybe got a little out of hand, the music, and and I heard that Nick uh, Jagger, he kind of was, he was the over, because it was his idea originally. I, I believe he saw a Casino, I was told, and he, you know, of course, has a relationship with Marty, and, and they said, hey, this would be a great idea to do like a casino with the music industry. I think the musical and the drug got into the way of the musical end, and be quite honest with you, Chris, Although he had Mick Jagger, I mean, there's no greater rock and roll story than Stephen Van Zandt. He is, uh, if you listen to the Underground Garage on Sirius Radio, I'm not plugging in, but I mean, you'll find out about rock and roll, the backstory, what happened with the groups. Yeah. I mean, he was the go to guy. I mean, I thought that he should be brought in as a, cons- a, a part time consultant, you know what I mean? Even directing it, I mean, I would have made him direct, yeah. direct the episodes because Stevie, I mean, and he directs. I mean, people don't know. I mean, he's, he's got a genius writer, too. I mean, and, and he knows about that business like the back of his hand. Yeah. I thought that that was, that could have been better if he was involved. But what are you going to do? It was Mitch Agger. And uh, yeah. it's hard across the pond to uh, direct, you know, if you live here. And then, I never even saw Nick on the set. I saw his son, Luke, who was great. You know, Jagger. Luke right. Jagger. Oh, that's his name. I think it is, you know. Yeah. I thought he was great on the show, but Nick never really visited the set. Yeah, he wasn't as involved. I, I th- wasn't present on the set, you know. Right, right. I think uh, you got a great point of it, but bringing in a Stevie Van Zandt would have been, would have really made it something special. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I mean, Terry knows Stevie. I mean, a good friend. But right. listen, it is what it is. And Marty has, you know, Marty's, a, he, you know, he's a, he's a boss. Marty's a boss. And, and um, yeah. he, he has a family, and, and and I respect him totally. I mean, this is not Terry's show all the way. It was Marty's show. Too. Yeah. And, uh, man, you know, hey, Marty, he's a genius, man. you got to go with Marty. <laughs> if he was somewhat let down by it being canceled, I, I was let down. I thought it was good. Yeah. People liked it. It know? was, yeah. I, I liked it. I thought uh, I was hoping it would go yeah. longer. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, were you a rock and roll fan? I mean, for uh, most of your life, you love rock and roll? Yeah, Beatles, started with the Beatles, 20 Cents, uh, Brooklyn, going to Avenue X to buy the Beatles Rubber Soul in a, a hardware store with my brother. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> 20 Cents, we got a transfer. I still remember it going into the August. I listened, going back to the, my uh, place, a little apartment, listening to the album on one of those Victrolas that flipped out, flipped down, you know? Yeah, yeah. You love rock and roll, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, the British Invasion, I mean, everything seemed to... Yes. Yeah, flip yeah. after that. Like, yeah, everybody wanted to get in a band after seeing the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have any of those dreams? Uh, well, yeah, a lot daydreaming, but <laughs> when I execute it, I'm not musical at all. I can carry a tune. I've done some musicals before. Yeah, I I did Godspell. I mean, I, I sang through some musical Godspell. I remember as one. I can I can call a song. A song. I'm okay, but when it comes to that vocal range and having the musical talent, uh, guitar, I don't I don't have it. Yeah. I, mean, I dream a lot. Yeah, I said, man, I'm going to sing this at my my sister's son's wedding. <laughs> I sure am. You know, we all do. You know, but listen, I I, I know myself, and that's one. Out, they don't have that, but uh, yeah, th- those those bands. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know, don't stop believing, man. I wish I could sing like uh, uh, Perry. Yeah, right. You know, are right. you kidding me? That song is great. It was such a great choice. That was, yeah, absolutely terrific song right there. So I don't want to hold you too long. I appreciate your time here. This is uh, Robert Funaro. Okay. You're listening to here on the Rock Stop. 
Um, but I do want to give you some plugs here, which you got coming up. You mentioned Space Cookie. Tell us about that a little bit. That's a one-man show. I was going to be doing a Broadway comedy club on uh, 55th Street and 8th Avenue. I think believe it's April 8th. You can go to their website, BroadwayComedy.com. Uh, it's my friend of mine, Mike Buschetti, and he's a terrific actor. He's along the lines of Daffy Duck, Abbott and Costello, and uh, he's got an album now, a CD, uh, a DVD, or whatever it was. And he's online streaming. Uh, if you look at Mike Buschetti, and you can get, really get a taste of his comedy. But anyway, it's about his four weeks of boot camp. And he basically got kicked out of Paris Island, and it, it, it starts from living in Staten Island to going to boot camp to meeting friends to be called Space Cookie by his drill sergeant. <laughs> it really is a funny, a funny roller coaster ride of a one man's journey. Yeah, I know Mike Boschetti through um, the Artie Lang show. I remember he used to be the announcer. Oh, so yeah, so you know Mike. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he's a very funny guy. I enjoyed him on that show. Uh, great deal. Yeah, so think of Mike Buschetti going through a bull camp. He's like Daffy Duck. I mean, he gets into all these situations, but he's able to get out of them because he's just so innocent. <laughs> he's yeah. Just so innocent. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I could imagine. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. that. So where where could you see that? That's going to be at the Broadway Comedy Club on uh, fifty. I think it's fifty fifth Street and Eighth Avenue. And you can go to the website BroadwayComedyClub dot com. So this is a, a humble beginning. Um, okay. You know, it might be, you know, it is what it is, and uh, we want to get started with it. So Mike booked the club, and I said, okay, I'll do it. I mean, I'd rather do it like a two-week run, but we need the money to do it. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else is there? Yeah, right. Well, you know, we're, we're, it's a start, like you said. and uh, Yes, Chris. I hope you come back. I, I, come I, as my guest. Yeah, well, I would come love to. my guest. I would, I would I'd love to. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to be out that way anytime soon, but I will certainly. <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly link it in the uh, interview okay. here, and I uh, hope anybody right. in that area will check it out because it sounds very funny. Thank you. Uh, on my Facebook page, we have the uh, advertisement, not the deer hunter one. The uh, one of his friends, uh, that is named, uh, <laughs> yeah. made a new uh, 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 post, and I thought it was great with the military, the guns, and everything. It was just fucking like great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys are in that area i will uh advise you to check that one out so all right all man right. this has really been great talking with you robert i appreciate you taking the time and uh, coming on the show here and listen chris for rock stop and and uh, thanks a lot i really appreciate it it's been a wonderful you know chatting with you and thanks for the opportunity i really appreciate it anytime man this is a lot of fun thanks again all right man you take care brother all right you too bye-bye